today, we will ask that you please take out your computer and refer, if you have it, if not, if you could find someone near you or you could refer to uh, theirs. Um, and if you could open up that email that I just, that I sent you uh, most recently, uh, the one with the document attached, that would be great. Um, so throughout the talk, Michael will be referring to this. And then, yeah, I'll ask that we try to minimize distractions and I'll move the, move the laptops out. All right, so I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker of the semester. Uh, we're super lucky to have him. His name is Michael Dennison. He's actually a Berkeley grad. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Parkworks. It's a U.S. distributor for advanced mechanical parking structures. And he has experience experience uh, as a real estate uh, real estate investor. I'm uh, sorry, real estate uh, developer, uh, a builder, and an engineer. So if we could please give him a big hand. Thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it was a little bit last minute. When did you send me that email? Sunday. Yeah. Sunday. Yeah, we had Sunday. So we had Sunday, had I discovered that I was going to be here talking to you guys. Um, and last night at 2.30 in the morning, I was awake, very awake, and I had an idea, and that was, I have quite a number of, I'm very fortunate to have interesting, successful friends, so when I got up at 6, I emailed them and said, give me some ideas uh, about business. These are pretty much all entrepreneurial people. Um, that's the first part of what you're looking at on your screen, I hope. Um, is anybody who needs to look at the computer, everybody's set, everybody can see what we're talking about? Okay, fantastic. Um, so there's there's ten people responded. Um, so there's there's uh, ten of those, and um, numbered one through ten, which is on the right hand side and the left hand side. Um, I've got some letters, and the idea is at the end of the class, what I'd like everybody to do is to match them up. So I'm going to talk first of all about myself a bit, and then about these friends. Um, and the concept is that if you guys can figure out who I'm talking about, um, from given the, the professions um, and the, the, the suggestions they've made. One or two are pretty easy, I have to say. Um, but, but maybe there'll be some challenges there. Um, so that'd be the idea. At the end of the class, we'll make the connections, and, and maybe whoever gets the highest score gets to be. What can, what can we give them? Can we give them anything? Uh, extra credit. <laughs> extra credit. OK. <laughs> okay. Um, so, First of all, uh, my name is Michael Dennison. I grew up on the East Coast, came out here to go to school. Um, loved my time at Cal. Um, and I uh, graduated, in, and I gave a similar talk about uh, two or three years ago, and was shocked to realize that from the time I graduated to the time I gave the talk, which is a long time, but I did involved with 30 different, over 30 different enterprises, 30 different jobs, things like that. And uh, one's always very nervous, or at least I am, talking in front of people. Um, you hope you'll be well received. You hope people will want more of what you have. And in fact, at the end of the class, someone did want more, only one person. But he came up and he said, Mr. Dennison, and I said, yes, ready to share even more of my wisdom with him. And he said, do you think, Mr. Dennison, if you'd stuck to one or two things, you'd have been more successful in life? That's a laugh, it's a joke. Well, it wasn't a joke, but uh, for me, it was. Um, it was very funny. Um, I urge you not necessarily to do 30 or more different things as I did, but I urge you to stretch yourself. This is scary what I'm doing now. Um, I was on live TV uh, a while back, um, and uh, there were sort of three or four people as a, a local TV show, but I think 300,000 people were going to be seeing me. And I was so nervous, I was sitting on one of the stools and I had a panic attack and started to pass out, almost fell off the stool. And about two minutes later, the producer of the show came up and said, the person who's supposed to go first is very uncomfortable, so we want you to go first. And I said, no problem. Um, got ready, was sitting on a stool with the two presenters, Spencer Christensen, Good Morning America, and Janelle Wang. Uh, the show was called View from the Bay. And just to sort of, they had this huge camera, huge clock, and I'm still sort of right on the edge of a panic attack, but I feel pretty calm. And the two people I'm going to be on live TV with, as I say, the huge clock's counting down. We've got like 90 seconds to go. They sit down and they're like, put their hand on mine to calm me down. It's like, oh, Michael, how's it going? And I said, Ugh. 
And uh, they looked at me like, oh, Houston, we have a problem here. Um, I, I think it's actually, you could probably still see it. I gave my talk, everything was fine, uh, nobody died. Um, so my suggestion is, as much as possible, uh, to stretch yourself, do frightening things. You, in some ways, grow calluses on your brain in a good way. So you're more comfortable the next time you do it. I guess I'm more comfortable than when I did it a few years ago. Um, what I'd like to do is, if you guys wouldn't mind scrolling past all the uh, sort of groups of comments um, to the last maybe half of the thing, it starts with a, it says MD, it looks like this on the sheet. So you guys have maybe heard the quip that I was going to write a short letter, but I didn't have time, so I wrote a long letter. Um, this is my long letter. This is, you know, from Sunday until now, trying to do work and do with my family and everything else. I just sort of, you know, uh, whatever came into my mind I wrote down. Um, and I'm not going to go through them because I bore you to death, but I will sort of tell you my entrepreneurial story. And then, and then towards the end of the class, uh, we'll go through everyone else's story. Um, the, as I say, the, the 10 people, and then you guys can guess who's what. And then there'll be Q&A. In the meantime, if anybody has any question about anything, feel free to, to interrupt. Like, it would be a kindness to me. It's, it's hard sort of. If you're not experienced standing and, and getting like zero input from anybody. Um, so let's see. Uh, real brief background for me. I, I guarantee that I'm the only one in this room that in their sophomore year in high school had five classes. The third semester, third quarter in high school, I got five Fs, um, which I took as an amazing achievement at the time. Because uh, really, I thought to myself, who gets five Fs? Even like the biggest bully in the world, they're going to get a D or two, but I got five Fs. Um, I was, grew up on the East Coast. My parents left me when I was 13, so I was sort of a little bit of a, uh, I lived in Paris for a while, and my roommate called me an orphan. I was an orphan. I wasn't really. But um, I then sort of turned around, and the next year got, you know, three A pluses and an A, I think the same, same semester, applied to Cal, and this is how different the times were back then. Um, applied to Cal, and Cal said no. I said, no, we don't want you. I applied to, I think, eight or nine of the schools, got into all of them except Amherst, um, was about to go to Tufts, and wrote Cal a letter saying, you know what, I concocted some story that for religious reasons, my family did in a yoga ashram, which they did in San Francisco, and I really had to go to Cal, it was the only school that was going to work for me, and they sent me a postcard back saying, you're, you're in. So times, <laughs> times have changed. Um, I had, <laughs> what, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't try that now. Um, I've never calculated my GPA, but it can't be more than a two. I mean, given my, my first two years were not so good. Um, I arrived at Cal, was very challenged, but uh, I think got lucky in terms of who I made friends with. I did very, very well here. Um, and then I got to the point where you guys will be shortly, and it's like you graduate college, you're going to graduate school or not. And for me, I sort of felt like I'd done my college thing. I took a gap year in the middle, and I wanted to get out in the world. Um, so as I say, 30 things, I'm only going to talk about two of them, maybe one or two others will sneak in. Um, the, I guess one of the things I want to get across today is how bad America and even Cal is at linking who you are to what you do. Um, I was an engineering student here, structural engineering, so I had to design buildings. Um, and I find that at the end of the day of studying, my mind was just like mush, and I, I felt like, you know, I had trouble concentrating, I, I just got sort of more and more weary as the day went on. And amazingly enough, I went out to the workforce, and at the end of the day, sitting at a desk, civil and structural engineering pretty dry, I felt the same way. So I worked as an engineer for, I guess, uh, uh, I worked first, I, I, I flew to, to Mexico and worked there for an amazing man. Then came back and got a job for design in a job uh, design firm here. Um, but after two years, I bought an old BMW car. It's a BMW 1600, and an architect in my firm referred me to a mechanic. I met this crazy Greek mechanic at the corner of Ashby and Shattuck, um, and sort of changed my life. Um, they say I, I don't want to offend anyone. I'm sure I will. They say when Greeks go crazy, they go really crazy. This guy was remarkably insane. Um, he, uh, I'm just trying to think of one or two anecdotes I can tell you. Um, he would, he would take, he had a high-powered rifle. This is, this is a different time, but believe me, it wasn't acceptable. Like he had a high-powered rifle and he would aim it out the door of his shop across Shattuck Avenue 
at a dealership across the street. And he'd say, don't you think if I shot a hole in that 55-gallon drum, don't you think that would really get their attention? I'd say, Gary, Gary, stop. Don't do this. Um, Gary also, um, not to get too far into the details here, but one more story about Gary. Um, and this is just sort of how life changes. Um, he was amazingly charming, but he also had an alcohol problem and a cocaine problem. So you never knew what you were going to get. Which people have told me that the children of alcoholics are the best at reading people. Because they, they get home and they never even know what they're going to get. And that was, Gary even told me once. He said, every time you, you come into the shop in the morning because I open, you stand a chance of getting shot. Um, and in fact, one night, or one morning I came in and he said, you've got to get that car to the body shop. And I said, why? And it turned out he'd shot the car. So this is a crazy, crazy man. Um, what I want to talk about in relation to him was expectation management. Um, I saw him at 4.30 in the afternoon with a client who'd come to get his car with his wife and the little kid, and Gary's looking at them and saying, your car is not ready. Um, clearly the wrong way to, to run a business. Um, and the amazing thing is, for the most part, Gary charmed his way out of it. I lasted there six weeks. Um, at one point, Gary looked across the car to me and said, uh, Dennis, and I'm going crazy, and I'm taking you with me. And my response was, no, that's, that's not going to happen. So I, I left there um, and was fortunate enough to have some money. I went and lived in Paris for six months, had an amazing time, just studied French and dance, and just at the time of my life. Came back, and I had a girlfriend living in Las Vegas who needed a job. So um, it seemed like the right thing to do to, and she was maybe going to come work with me. Um, she now has a PhD in French, whatever that's worth. Um, so she came, I opened this repair shop with six weeks of experience. Um, and, and sort of one of the things that, that is on this sheet, and everybody I've talked to has said this is true, is you sort of fake it till you make it. Um, and I didn't just, I was not arrogant about it. I paid people who knew, had particular skill sets. I learned the skill sets. I don't think I ever did a bad job fixing anybody's car. But had the repair shop um, and still have the repair shop. That was 1984. Um, one of the things somebody told me at the time, I had a girlfriend in Paris, um, and he said, he said, you know, I, I, my idea was to come back and work for six months fixing cars, then go back to Paris and make a little bit of money. Um, he said, you're not going to do that. He said, you're going to you know, you're going to have kids, you're going to sell down or something, you know, is going to keep you here. And that was, I think I have a note in here, that was a piece of advice from some dumb old guy that turned out to be true. Um, so not that all dumb old guys or old guys give you good advice or, or accurate advice, but it certainly, certainly worked out that way. Um, from, a, from a financing standpoint, I started with a floor jack and a couple hundred dollars of tools and um, some jack stands. Um, so now here we are. That's too frightening to think how many years later. Um, but whoever can do the math there, um, is it 38 years? Yeah, 38 years. But it's a lot of years later. Um, the 16 and 18 is 34 years later. Um, we've done over. You know, it's a, it's a service business, so it's not an explosive business. It's not an exciting business. I doubt any of you want to go into a service business. One of the guys on this list here, MBA from Harvard, has said he, he graduated Harvard, and he said he sort of he designed his perfect job. And one of the things in his perfect job was he didn't want a service business because he didn't want to be tied to revenue and his time. Um, he had a couple other interesting things. He didn't want any employees, um, and we'll, we'll get to him later. And he didn't want to have to put any capital into it. And he's been amazingly successful. He lives in Malibu. He has a beautiful house. Um, and he hardly ever works. Um, so my apologies if I'm sort of uh, running around here. But, but we'll get back to the repair shop. Um, the repair shop over the last, I don't know, probably 10 years or so has an income of about, or has a gross revenues of about $3 million a year. So if you do the math there, over since we've opened it, I don't know, maybe 60 or $70 million. Having started with floor jack and um, and some jack stands, the overwhelming principle the whole time has been to do quality work and to treat everybody fairly. You know, sort of all the funny cliches. Um, I encourage you, if, if you get bored with me, to look at your screen and look at some uh, what the other people have said. Because as I say, we are going to be sort of uh, having a little quiz on that at the end. But I know a lot of my friends have stressed how important it is to create value, and you create value. One of the guys says it's corny, but you create value by, of course, by being customer-centric, giving people what they want. Um, I also had exceedingly high standards. Um, 
there's a book by John McPhee that talks about Arthur Ashe playing a tennis tournament against a guy named Grabner. And um, in the book, he says that Ashe wasn't competing against Grabner, he was competing against perfection. And that sounds corny, but that's sort of always been my goal is, in business, a lot of times your customers are not in a position to evaluate what you do. So you're sort of the, the adult in the room, um, and it's up to you to know the standards that you should meet and to, to provide the highest standards. I have another quip here about adults in the room, and that is that adults aren't. Um, I don't know how much personal experience you guys have, but the huge majority of people that get to be 60, 70, 80 years old, 40, 50, whatever, don't ever necessarily grow up. So um, keep that in mind in terms of your dealings. Don't expect too much from your parents. Uh, don't expect too much from other people. Just because they have gray hair doesn't mean that they're adult. There's a, a French song that says it takes some talent to become old without becoming adult. And it seems like most of us have that talent. Um, so back to the shop. Any questions? Any questions about getting started? Zero business experience. I was a structural engineer. Um, was I arrogant? Most certainly. I did exceedingly well at Cal. Figured I was a smart guy. Wasn't afraid of hard work. Um, would there be qualities that would be more important than that? Absolutely. Um, did I look at the books? Never. Um, did I get audited in my first full year of business? Yes. Why did I get audited? Um, I sat down filling out my tax return. My family advised me not to tell the story, but I filled out the tax return and I made up numbers. So advertising is spent, I don't know, $30,000. And at the end of my tax return, I think I made like 20 bucks over the year. So the IRS sent two revenue agents to my business. Um, revenue agents, sort of an adult auditor, um, so the serious guys. And they wanted to know how much I spent for toothpaste, how much I spent for haircuts, how much I spent for all these things. Um, and I'm going to make light of this, but leading up to that were some of the most unhappy two months of my life. Because I had this stuff that I knew was a lie, I knew I could potentially go to jail for it. Um, so I, I, I had the audit, and, and as I said, I had the two revenue agents, I'm sitting down with them, and, and I, was, I was a little bit on the clever side. Um, my shop at that point was a hole in the wall, it was outside, it was the middle of winter, it was very, very cold. Um, so I was aware of this, the revenue agents arrived, they were not aware of it, and uh, after like four hours, one got too cold and left, the other one sat there, I swear to God, his nose started running, his, uh, his, it started getting a little bit blue, he started shaking a little bit, um, and I, in the meantime, had long underwear on and like six coats and was comfortable as can be. He came back for a second day, and on that second day, we repeated the same thing, he got colder and colder and colder, and then I, you've seen the little radiant heaters that are at, the, um, at all the restaurants. I had one of those radiant heaters and I noticed that if you like shown it right at someone, their ability to think went down. So I sat here, sort of had my heater here, had the review agent who was shaking. I said, would you like some heat? He said, oh, that'd be wonderful. Showed it on him and I swear to God, towards the end of the day, this man is saying, I don't know what it is, but I can't concentrate. I just, I don't know what's going on. So I said that my $30,000 of advertising expense was an automobile that I bought to resell. I said I bought it as an advertising expense. I, I hired some very high-powered lawyers before the audit, and one of the best pieces of advice the guy gave me, I talked about it, imputed interest. Anybody imputed interest? No? No. So imputed interest means if you're my son and I lend you money, um, and, and you pay me back in five years, the government will say, we don't care that you guys are family, we're gonna impute interest because the IRS wants him to pay me interest and then me to pay taxes on that interest. So when I was talking, to one, I knew about imputed interest. Um, when I was talking to one of these, uh, these this, this revenue, uh, actually sorry, the attorney, when I was talking to the attorney, I brought up imputed interest and he looked at me and said, can't use the word, but he said, Michael, you are a dumb F. You do not know what imputed interest means. You're going into this audit as a complete idiot. You're saying you bought a $30,000 car, which I had bought, and you're using it for advertising. So I think at the end of the audit, I owed him 20 bucks or something. Um, as I say, I'm making light of it. Ever since then, I've been exceedingly careful about my tax returns, as I would advise everyone. Never put anything on your tax return that you can't fully back up and justify. Um, any other questions about starting a business from zero? How did you educate yourself? Because you said you didn't, you didn't study any of the business side in college, so how did you educate yourself? Uh, 
well in that sense. Yeah, so Nolo Press, local company, we're very lucky to have it in Berkeley. Um, Nolo Press makes uh, legal books and, and business books that are now all online. I'd recommend, I own some property now, so I'm a landlord. They have a landlord law book. They have the tenant's law book if you want to be a tenant. And they have how to do business books. Um, I read those. There was guerrilla marketing. A lot of these books talked about not the, the advantage of not being heavily capitalized, which I wasn't. I had like absolutely zero money. The idea is if you're heavily capitalized, then you can spend it on the wrong things. Um, and we'll talk about later. One of the guys who wrote in um, is sort of does high tech marketing, and we had a conversation earlier today, and he's like, "Let me tell you about entrepreneurship." Bootstrapping, not entrepreneurship. So, not entrepreneur. Sorry to, by his definition anyway. Um, and I've always thought it was kind of a silly term anyway. I'd never felt that way. Um, but, but what do you do in business? You, you hang up a shingle. You, you know, literally, we would ride around. I had a motorcycle. I'd ride around my motorcycle with my girlfriend, and she would put flyers on cars, on a BMW repair shop. And um, what was really discouraging is we put flyers that had like a great deal for a service or just whenever I was out at dinner or wherever, you just put a business card on the windshield. And the business card was as effective a marketing tool as anything else we ever use, which is just like, it's sort of the equivalent of your husband or wife falling in love with their contractor. It's like, just because they happen to be there, well, it's just kind of an insult, isn't it? So just knowing that a business is there. But again, that was, and of course, cost nothing. In, in the years since, we've spent tons of money here and there, one of the most effective uh, things. Now we also had a total niche, and, and um, I guess I was a little bit clever there. I didn't know anything about fixing cars, so I picked the old simple car, BMW 2002s or 1600s, the little boxy cars, carbureted cars, no fuel injection. Um, so that helped, that I was working on only one kind of car. People loved that. They were sort of a cult car, um, so that, was, that ended up being very successful as well. They'd come to my shop and they'd see nothing but 2002s, and we actually, to this day, we still work on a lot of 2002s. Yeah. Um, so, but, but business, how complicated from a bootstrapping standpoint, it takes time. But I think the first month in business, we made like 400 bucks or something. And then every month after that, we made a little bit more money um, and actually had like 15% growth forever, however long it takes to get from, you know, if we made $10,000 the first year to $3.5 million now. And it doesn't take long. It certainly doesn't take 30 some years. Um, but we got there and plateaued. And the other, Probably the most successful thing I've done in business is over 20 years ago, I stepped out of operations at my company. I, I ended up being just incredibly lucky. Um, my wife and I were returning from Italy from a vacation and sprinted through JFK Airport and took like the last seats on the plane next to this really nice kid who was just coming back from his Dartmouth reunion um, and had just was totally hungover. All he wanted to do was lie down and we sweat hogs, my wife and I sat down next to him. Um, he was working at Oracle, I'm not sure everybody knows that. He found it soul killing. He came to work for me, um, and some of his sister still works for me. He then went on and got a, a master's in education from Harvard, and uh, is now a doctor. He went to UCSF um, as a successful doctor. So I sort of bring that up to like serendipity, like who, how do you plan something like that? One of his best friends, a Yale graduate, is now my partner. And he became my partner about 10 years ago, but about 10 years before that, I stepped out of the business, handed it over to him. Um, and, and there's only one way that can happen is that you're lucky enough to have someone who cares and is intelligent and is, is exceedingly capable. He's, he's, of course, all those things. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the transition. What that did is 20 years ago made me free to go do whatever else I wanted. And I promise not to talk about all those other things. Um, but some of them were hugely successful. I shorted a single stock and made a couple hundred thousand dollars. And then I was so smart that I shorted uh, Cisco, bad, America Online, good, but early. Early, same as, you guys heard this? Early, same as wrong. So I sh shorted America Online when America Online was doing this. Now America Online did this, and I knew it was going to do this. But I was crushed in the meantime. Um, so, Repair shop. Any other questions on that? Yes. So you took out a loan. I didn't. I didn't. I had a few dollars. I, you know, I, I took a year off from college. I was a merchant seaman. I bought a house when I was 19. I rebuilt it and sold the house when I came back to Cal and had I don't know ten thousand dollars in the bank or something. But I don't think I even particularly used it. I, you know, I was essentially a college kid. 
didn't, yeah, didn't need, you know, didn't, my, my expenses were very, very low. So, um, among the things I've done over the years is, is real estate development. Um, and uh, in about five years ago, I built a building adjacent to a building that I built some 25 years ago. Shop, this was my existing shop. We built a building next to it, which is a three-story building. I've got the city attorney from, from San Francisco right from the two top floors, amazingly enough, above an auto repair shop, right? I mean, you, you go to somebody and you say, hey, I've got this great property. You know, for your law firm, there's an auto repair shop downstairs. I swear to God, they signed a seven-year lease, and they're like three years into it. Um, in the process of doing so, I purchased a mechanical parking system. Um, so again, serendipity. I'm not saying serendipity is good or bad, but that's sort of how I've lived my life. Um, and that mechanical parking system that I purchased, it was a big investment, it was a quarter million dollars. Um, and I built a building to sort of house it, and the president of the company liked my building, liked doing business with me, and said, why don't you be the United States distributor for my company? That was about four years ago, um, and I'd done a bunch of other things, as I say, in between. Um, the, so for that, I had an income. I had my repair shop that gave me you know, a, a very good income without having to go to work, which, as I say, it's a minor miracle. Um, and you know, I think that is, to my mind, one of the biggest reasons to be an entrepreneur is to start something um, and have it either be a cash cow or have it be something that's valuable enough that you can sell it and then, then live. Because it was, it gave me the 20 years that my children were kids, I got to spend with them. Of course, I did a bunch of other things as well. But, um, so, parking system, um, this is what's to know about that. It's a long cycle. You're talking to somebody who's about to build a building, um, and like a year, two, three years after you start talking, you actually make the sale. So that's something if you needed financing, you wouldn't need financing to do that. You can't just go buy two jack stands and a few tools. Um, what have I learned about that business? Um, one of the things is, and this, this might seem obvious, but it certainly wasn't obvious to me, is I represent a company that has the best product in the world, but they've got horrible service. And what's that mean? It means that when I need to get shop drawings, which are the drawings that the builder needs so he can design his building around your system, rather than taking two weeks or a month, it takes three or four months. And who looks like the idiot during those months? I do. Um, so before we've even got on the job site, we're often the goat on projects. Um, German company, you know, German's reputation for organization. Um, so I decided if Germany can't be organized, who's even more organized in Germany? Switzerland. And I have a business relationship with a very established, very organized Swiss company at this point. Um, let's see what else. Um, it's import, so you have sort of all you have to deal with in that regard, which isn't that big a deal. Probably the biggest single uh, factor is, I don't know if you guys followed the dollar, the dollar this summer was $1.06, it's now $1.24. Um, so that 14 15 was 18 percent, so it's probably about a 16 percent margin there. Just went away. So if you make, you know, if I was making 20 percent on a deal, now I'm making 4 percent on a deal. Are there ways to to combat that? Can you get futures and things like that? Yes. I wish I had. Yes. So total total mistake there on my part. Um, so revenues, first year 800,000, second year 1.2 million, third year which was 2017. 2.7 million. So, and and this year, if things go well, we'll be at about five or six million. Um, of course, it's not the top line you care about; it's what you get to keep. Um, it's an exploding market, so I'm excited to be part of that. Um, a lot of people are coming into the market. There's a lot of competition. There's a company that just started about the same time I did, and they have like 30 million dollars of sales on their books, and I've got maybe 10. And it's like, well, they're doing much better than me, except they're Maybe they are, maybe they're not. They're a bunch of marketers. They don't know how to execute. They don't know how to install. And I'm getting calls from people that have designed their whole building. They're building their building. And then it turns out these guys can't put it in, can't make it work. It does go in. A uh, couple questions on that. And we're running out of time here. We'll get to the other list of things. Anybody? No? Oh, OK. Um, so let's, if we could just go through real quickly. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the people who's, um, I think, how would I do this? Well, let's just go, let's just go through it. Uh, the first one on your list is 
is Larkin, who starts with, hello, Mr. Dennison. Um, she's got a couple uh, fairly generic suggestions about how to uh, succeed in business is what's important. Um, and I guess I've already given away that it's a she, uh, but I don't know if that makes too much difference. Um, the next guy has written a bit more. Um, has anybody had a chance to read any of these and have any questions about them? Um, I, I know it's, it's, it's hard without sort of uh, I, um, without any uh, sort of thing to, to hang your head on. Um, any, any questions, any feedback on these? No, okay. Well, feel, feel free to, to jump in. So what we're doing here is we've got 10 different people who've given business advice. And we know, prof we know professions and the idea is to sort of match the professions to the, the, um, to the business advice that they've given. Um, and um, bear with me just one second. I'm going to give a little bit of thought as the best way to do this. I think it's just up to the brain and process it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. No, absolutely. And we, we don't have a lot of time here. I'm certainly aware of that. Um, but let's let's get started. Let's just um, <coughs> so maybe we'll take if we could start with the Hey Michael, which is about on page three or so. Um, so his points are, uh, I think, very well taken. Uh, people want to be an entrepreneur because they don't want to be a boss. He says it doesn't work that way as an entrepreneur. Both your customers and your employees are your boss. Anybody want to grab that and make a comment on it? How can your employees and your customers be your boss? Boring question. I agree. Oops, there's a. Um, I mean, Let's go. Your, your customers can be your boss because you have to provide for them, so you're pretty much working to um, do things so that you can make money for yourself, but you also are working for the other people, not just for yourself. Absolutely. And your success depends on, yeah. on making them happy. Your employees is maybe a little bit less obvious, but very, very profound. The way a friend of mine's put it is, you know, everybody focuses on keeping your customer happy. Your assets walk out the door every night. Your assets walk out the door every night. And you need to treat your employees as well as you do your customers, or else you're not going to have them anymore. Um, as a friend of mine has put it, you're sort of held hostage by your employees. So you think, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, I've got all this stuff. This afternoon, I just found that my head technician at the shop, again, I'm not involved in operations, is leaving to go to another shop. It's a kick in the gut, but I also wanted to mention that you recover from these things. You think, oh my god, that's a disaster, but it's, a, it's something that you can deal with. Um, he makes a great point. Uh, single most important activity in which you'll engage is hiring. Treat it as such. Uh, I think I've got in my notes, you, you hire slowly and you fire quickly. Um, I've fired probably about 20 people over the course of my career. It's the worst thing I do. I hate it. I don't want to be in business every time I have to do it. Um, I've never fired anyone too early. I've always, after I fire them, it's like, well, should have done that months ago. Um, along the lines, careful of those lines, be careful dealing with friends and family because you want to be in a position where if they're not working out you can just terminate them. I hired a friend's daughter not long ago and it was agonizing over the course of months for me to get to the point where I had to tell her that it wasn't working out. Um, let's see, let's go down the page. Uh, so Bill, so so he sort of, he disses on B-School here. He says, he says, in some sense B-School just teaches the old way of doing things. Um, seems a little bit unfair, but he's, a, he's kind of an arrogant jerk. He's exceedingly successful. Um, and, and he's the one who made the point of if you bootstrap, you're not an entrepreneur. His way of looking at it is, I thought, pretty fascinating. He says, you've got $10 million, all that stuff they taught you about inventory turn and profit and margin, all that stuff, you don't care about that. You've got $10 million, you've got a certain amount of time before you burn through it, and you have to, uh, you have to execute in that time period. He also made, I thought, a fascinating point is, is he happens to be a noisy jerk, so he's got the big personality. He, he said, first he said, have a big personality, then he said, actually, don't. But if you do have one, it's great, because he said, people invest in people. He said that by the time you're done with a project, oftentimes the, 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 the product has changed four or five times. 
but they've still got the same person that they're working with. So that, that, um, if you can be that big person and, and be genuine, that's great. Of course, if you're more reserved, then you're more reserved. Um, he also made the point that a bunch of people have made, the boss defines the culture by hiring, um, and, and that's definitely true. I'm working on a project right now in San Francisco, huge construction company, they just did Salesforce Tower, um, biggest building west of the Mississippi, if you ignore the, the mast on top of the building in LA. Um, and I've got two projects with them. One is a stellar team, they're the best people, they're super fair, they're super smart. And the other team, I lose sleep over on a regular basis because they're, they're just not quality people. They say things to me like, you know, I, say, I refer to something that we've agreed to, and they say, you don't have anything in writing to show, you know, that what you just said, which is a good point. And, you know, that's, of course, you guys, you can't hear it too many times to have things in writing. But the teams are often directed from top down, and um, you can have great teams or terrible teams in a company, and um, it's, it's tough to know. I would never do business with this team again. Um, I don't care how, how successful it would be. So this next one, most important traits, leadership, resilience, passion. Um, let's see, select a team of people with the right skill set. The whole thing is your, your vision. Um, this guy sounded like he got an MBA. He did get an MBA. A hint there. Um, but he's, he's been incredibly successful in life. Um, let's see, you know, he says, have grit, don't be discouraged by early failure. That's a message I've got from a lot of people. Um, the message I wanted to give you guys is, you're all incredibly smart, talented, you're going to a great university. You have to be a little bit careful. Remember my amazing success shorting that stock, I made all that money, and it's like, God, I'm so smart. I'm so, so smart. And shorted Cisco and America Online, and it turned out I wasn't really that smart. So you sort of need some failure to humble you a certain amount. So don't, don't always, of course, be terrified of failure. Um, that, that you, know, you should, you, you definitely, you do everything you can to avoid it, but if, if it happens, as everybody says, you, you bounce back and you're, you're smarter. Um, let's see, the second one he talks about the no bozos rule. So this is the second one on the sheet. And scalability, uh, which should give you a bit of an idea when every other word out of somebody's mouth is scalable, you think they might have something to do with the internet. Um, he's, a, he's one of my best friends. Hire and, and um, says hire a great team as early as possible. Keep the bar high, no bozos. Um, a players, he says hire people who are better than you at what they do. I have a number of employees who are way better than me, that, than, than, better than I in, in terms of, of executing, and, and that, I'm thrilled to have them. Um, one of this person's metrics, so it might give it away a little bit, is um, can anybody get, throw out a number of what he feels the proper gross revenue per employee is. And he's, he's diversified, he's, he's, he's in all sorts of different businesses, um, but somebody throw out a number. So revenue per employee, it's a real quick just glance of, you know, if, if you've got $50,000 of revenue per employee, in, certainly in the Bay Area, you're, you're out of business in a very short time. Um, any, any guesses? And this guy's done it, he's done it high tech, and he's done it like Procter & Gamble style products as well. So 200,000, I remember reading, this is like 20 years ago, that people wanted 150,000. This guy's a million dollars. He's a million dollars per employee. So if he's got, right now he's got a $50 million company, he's got like 48 employees, and he's gonna keep it that way. Um, he's the single most successful guy I know. Um, so that's something to, to, uh, to pay attention to. You know, am I, right now my company, as I said, we're at like $3 million, so I have three employees. Kind of actually have two employees in the office and then a field installation crew of four. So I'm certainly more like 500,000 than a million. A million's pretty, pretty amazing if you can do that. Um, on B, he makes the, the point, the Goldilocks principle. Um, in terms of capital, you want the right amount, not too much, not too little. Um, the next person, I know we're running out of time here. The next person's three most important things, uh, be open to feedback. Uh, I always sort of liken it that you've got two buttons. You've got the send button and the receive button. And some people you've met go through life, their send button's stuck on. Doesn't matter what you say, wh how your life is like, what's going on in your day, they're just sending. Um, and of course it turns out in business that, that 
being able to receive is, is very, very uh, important as well. Customer centered, um, if you guys ever heard of Next Bench? So Next Bench is you're this geeky engineer and you develop this great new product and you show it to the engineer at the Next Bench and he gets all excited, he's like, oh, that's wonderful. That doesn't mean that anybody who's not a geeky engineer is gonna want your product. So that's to, to be avoided. Um, along sort of the, a little bit the same lines there, not invented here, anybody heard of that one before? It's fairly straightforward. The idea is that if you have a big company and you come to them with some brilliant new product, they're like, well, we didn't figure that out, so it can't be that great. Um, she also says communicate early and often. Um, and you guys, if you have any interest at all, of course, are, are welcome to uh, read these at length. Um, the next person is most important traits, stay focused. Uh, maybe you've, you've noticed that I have trouble staying focused. Um, and, and I think you, I mean, my, my biggest takeaway tonight is know yourself. Um, that, that for me, like even in the parking world that I'm in, these mechanical machines, if I like install a couple of them, I kind of feel like that mountain's climbed. I want to go do something else. And it's kind of frightening how quickly that happens. So um, you've heard the old saw that the person who starts the company is not the person who should be running the company. You want somebody sort of steady who's interested more in the, in the numbers rather than the, the shiny new thing down the block. Um, but you need to figure out if, you know, which of those people you are. Um, let's see, I think we've got one or two more. You know that this one, number three, who's your daddy? Your values and ethics are the foundation of your structure. He's incredibly, uh, he's got a, a tremendous character and, and it shows in his business. Um, he talks about not giving up. Someone else talks about being 100% accountable. Um, you, people of a certain age will tell you, never blame a mistake that your company makes on one of your employees. You're running the company, you're in charge of the company, and you're responsible for uh, what, the, what, what comes out of your company. Um, I think the last one, is this the last one? Yes, it is. The last one, these ideas have worked for me. Uh, this is, uh, He's saying, stick to your knitting, know a lot about a little, as opposed to a little about a lot. I think I'm certainly guilty of a little about a lot, but I also go fairly deep as well. Um, avoid the herd mentality, sell when everybody else is buying, and vice versa. Uh, never sign personally, um, and that means that you don't put your personal assets uh, at risk in a deal. Be open to new ideas while at the same time staying with your core strengths. Uh, align yourself with good people. Don't hesitate to bring them on as partners if they can add value. Hire the best consultants. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about that. There's a level as if you are not if you're the boss of the company, you get input from all these brilliant consultants, and then what? Then you are the one who has to make the decision. The consultants are sometimes wrong. Um, maybe not about the technical matters, but about the, the big matters. Um, so. We've come to the end. You guys are very kind for staying awake for the most part. Um, let's uh, go down the list here and see if we can do this. Would you mind helping me out, Augustine, just in terms of connecting the dots here? So uh, I guess what I'm going to do is read the first person that starts with, hello, Mr. Dennison. And uh, I don't know if you guys what would be most fun here? Let's just everybody sort of throw out ideas as to, to who that might be. Freshman. I'll freshman. <laughs> no, freshman. Bingo. Freshman, she's supposed to be here. She's, I don't know what happened to her. She had a class that got out late. Uh, she's never come in. Uh, so, uh, you're absolutely right. So that means that D goes to one. So, you guys started strong. Number two is kind of an easy one, too. And I, so, so, this is the Hey Dude. Massive, Anybody? massive tech company. Massive tech company. Yes, this is at the time I think it was, and the time wasn't that long ago. I think it was like you know, the top three tech companies in the world. Um, so, uh, so what does that mean? That means that number two goes to anybody. E. Where does it say massive tech company? That's E. 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 Yes. Okay. Uh, perfect. Number three. Successful entrepreneur. Three most important traits of a successful entrepreneur. You guys are batting a thousand so far. So 
So feedback, customer-centered, communicate early and often. What was your guess? I think Mike High tech marketing? No, high tech marketing, no, not high tech marketing. Uh, uh, not the printer guy. Real estate? Nope. It's kind of it's kind of softer and gentler, and she's sort of one of the, the more soft and gentle people on the list. Um, and I just need to find out where she went. Design firm, so she's C. So C goes to three. I guess that was an easy one. Uh, next one, most important traits. You don't really have much to go on. I'll give you that. She's the importer of French wine. Um, the next one, start. Get clear about what you want to do and create. Then take the first step. <coughs> so it should be getting easier, right? Creative writing and branding. No, and the only thing that giving credit writing is a creative writing guy, he ought to be able to write. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's the, the sailing school. Oh. Um, so, H. H2. I think it is. We're going down the list. We are going down the list. Yep. I don't have numbers on my sheet, but okay. you guys do. Um, so, Q. Few quick riffs. It's H5. Riffs, kind of a cool word, right? Kind of the type of word that a, a creative writing person might do. So, that was a giveaway. No, no, no. He's the writer. He's the writer. If you take a look, you'll see he does a, a great job with it. So, I think that's five. It goes with A. Creative that writing and branding. That one's six. Oh, no, was that six already? Yeah, I'm sorry. Four. We skipped. I mean, oh, we skipped one? Four, four was, we didn't skip. Four was the wine, but. Oh, okay. Four was G. G, G, the absolute right. Four. Yep. She's the, and just six. the two line one. Six is... Okay. And then is our next one... Sorry, I don't have numbers on my sheet. Who knows what's seven? These ideas, These ideas have worked for me. Okay, these ideas have worked for me. Anybody? I'll give you a hint. He talks about never sign personally. Oh, is this a real estate problem? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, incredibly successful. Very simple there. San Francisco based. Um, so that is going to be. Let's see where to go. F? Partner So he's F. He's F. Um, they know San Francisco real estate, and that's they sort of stick to their knitting. I'm actually partners with them on a project in Sacramento, and he's like, we shouldn't have done that. We know San Francisco. We know the Valley, and and that's what they do. Um, as I say, they're the they they're sort of thought of as the smartest guys in town. Um, so again, it should be getting really easy at this point, right? Are we on to number eight? Mm -hmm. So some people want to be an entrepreneur because they don't want to be a boss. There's no way to know this. He's the printer. <laughs> Which variable is that? Uh, it's B. So B goes to eight, I think. So the printer, this guy tripped along. I know I'm out of time, so I'll go super quick. But he tripped along for like 15 years. He's a Quaker. He grew up in Philadelphia. Very, very humble. And then like he got a call from some company he never heard with him. He flew to the headquarters and they're like, he's like, who are you guys? And it was Abercrombie and Fitch. And I guarantee there's no clothing line now that he doesn't represent. He goes in and makes their colors better than anybody else can make them. He's fabulously successful at selling printers. But he doesn't sell printers. He sells the look and the color that go along with them. Um, be ready to figure things out on your own is the high tech marketing I. So I think that's nine goes to I and J would be ten. Yes, exactly. So just a real quick word on on the last one. This is Harvard MBA. He comes out of Harvard. He's at. Uh, trade show. He's on his door. He's on his way out the door at the trade show, and there's some Italian guy. He happens to be Italian. There's some Italian guy sitting there selling stoves. And he goes over, chats with them for a minute. They're now doing stoves, refrigerators, dishwashers. He's they, he goes back to the factory once a year. They close the factory. They're doing over sixty million dollars a year in business because he stopped at a desk on the trade show on the way out. Very smart guy. Very hardworking guy. Um, thank you guys very very much. Uh, thank you.